Hello and welcome to Guild Wars Players News, the podcast where we take a look at Guild Wars game series news and talk about content on our site, Guild Wars Players. I'm Sithrith, and today we have Draculetta. Hey, everybody. And we have a Thoros. Hey. Hey. So I'm not sick this week, which is really exciting um, because I won't collapse into a pile of coughing and death. <laughs> In theory, unless I just jinx myself. Um, but yeah, hopefully this will be back to normal podcasting. At least I hope so for the sake of my throat. So this week we got a new reveal for the next Elite Specialization. We were on a really long break from those for a while, but we're back on track now. Um, and this week we got The Tempest, which is the uh, Elementalist Elite Specialization. Most people, based on some data mined information, were assuming that the Tempest was going to include the main hand sword for an elementalist. However... The Gandalf. <laughs> the, the, A.K.A. the Gandalf. Um, however, uh, the Tempest took a different turn than people expected, and it comes with the Warhorn offhand weapon. Not what most people were expecting, but I guess when you think about it, the temp- a Tempest is, you know... Like a storm, like a lot of wind and stuff, so Mm -hmm. it makes sense. So, um, another interesting thing about this reveal was not just that it wasn't something that people were expecting, but also that the reveal came via 10-ton hammer rather than the official site first. So that's also kind of an unusual uh, approach to the reveal, but then, of course, today, uh, ArenaNet also posted on their own site, so... It kind of corroborated all the information. So an, an interesting thing about this elite specialization is that besides the Warhorn skill set, obviously, that the elite specialization will come with, there's also going to be a new system for elementalists to use if they choose to specialize as a Tempest, and it's called overloading. Basically, once you are attuned to a given element for a certain amount of time, you gain quote unquote singularity with the um, attunement with the element and you are able to kind of hit that F1, two, three, four skill again as if you were switching back into that same attunement. But then it channels an overload skill. And obviously the overload skills are different for each uh, element. So for overlord overlord <laughs> overload fire. I mean I guess you could be an o- overlord over the elements as well, but uh, if you overload fire, you build an infernal tornado over time that continually damages and burns enemies while granting allies might. Completing the ability um, leaves a tornado at your current position for a period of time. Um, With the water one, you make a bubble of water that allows you to regenerate and cleanse conditions from yourself and allies, and then when you're done channeling, the bubble pops and provides AoE healing. So... It's it's very based on whatever element you're doing, and then once you overload an element like this, you are locked out of using that attunement for a brief amount of time. I mean, usually when you are switching between elements, you can't switch back to an element for a couple seconds, but I'm assuming with overload, it's, it's a longer amount of time. Um, they also gave us information on the utility skills, which sound pretty interesting. <clears throat> um, these are all shout which makes sense because the Tempest seems to be all about um, wind and vocalization with the Warhorn and stuff. So um, the heal is called Wash the Pain Away, and it heals allies and cleanses conditions from them. Uh, There's a utility for each different attunement. So there's a fire one where you sear your voice into the ground, which causes growing flames to emit from that location, which sounds kind of crazy. Um you For the air-based one, you can summon a thing called Eye of the Storm, and you call a storm down on nearby allies to break stuns. Um, and the Earth ability, Aftershock, you create a powerful earthen force around you, crippling nearby enemies. So there's a lot of really cool-sounding stuff here. Um, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what it's going to be like, though, until tomorrow when we get the live stream on the official Guild Wars 2 Twitch channel where they're going to be showcasing gameplay, and the game designer, Carl McLean, will be talking about The Tempest. Um, the other interesting thing about this 10-ton... Ten ten, I cannot say 10-ton ten hammer today. 10-ton <laughs> hammer article was that they also had an interview with Carl McLean, and they talked a lot about this uh, Tempest specialization. Um, it's pretty long, so I put most of it in our 
article on the site, so you can go read it. But one interesting thing, well, two interesting things he talked about was that basically the Warhorn is going to have, it sounds like the best synergy if you use a dagger in your main hand and war Warhorn in your offhand. And also it's going to be a much more uh, frontline, close range kind of fighter, the Tempest, rather than a typical elementalist, even a dagger dagger elementalist who can kind of be mid-range because the dagger skills are a bit closer, but with Warhorn, I guess you're going to be want, going to want to be a bit closer. So that's definitely a bit different, and uh, I look forward to seeing the gameplay. It could it could go either way. I think it sounds pretty good, though. It doesn't sound overly bad or anything. Sound like a good opportunities for some fancy um, visuals, at least. Yeah. Especially the, um, the Earth one. Yeah, the Overload Earth skill sounds really cool because apparently you take a ride on the Earth. So, like dirt surfing or basically all i can think about is um avatar the last airbender type earthbending stuff yeah it's basically what elementalists are anyway so yeah elementalists are the avatar basically so yeah yeah can i just say though that some of these utility skills have really bad names yeah like wash the pain away well the weird thing is in both the Ten Ton Hammer article and on the official um, ArenaNet Guildwars Two dot com post, they all have exclamation points in them, like "Wash the pain away," "Feel the burn," oh, "I, I have a storm," "Aftershock," "Freeze," "Rebound." Like they are all, they all have exclamation points because I guess they're shouts. So I guess that's you know exclamation point means I'm shouting it. So I hope they're not in the actual game. Exclamation I mean, points. I just don't like them um, like that in abilities. Like it just, just not in abilities like that. It, I just don't like it. And to be honest, Wash the Pain Away is too lengthy. I think it's kind of cumbersome as a name. And Feel the Burn is just cheesy. I guess. But I and based on the Arena Net post, it sounds like your character is actually going to be saying these things. Now, there's some skills oh, right now. Gosh. There's some skills right now that do this anyway. Like, there's some guardian skills. Um, <clears throat> there's some warrior skills. Like, every so often oh, you'll yeah. hear somebody say, retreat! Yeah, my yeah, yeah. guardian does that. Yeah, so it's like that, but elementalist ones. I mean, so it doesn't be even make sense when my guardian says it, because I use it when I'm going into fights. Yeah, well. So yeah. We, we might be hearing ele- elementalists shouting, wash the pain away and feel the burn! <laughs> As if female Savari <laughs> went already obnoxious. Yeah, that's the thing. When I heard, when I read that, I was like, "Man, I'm glad I don't have a female Solvari elementalist." That is good. I am happy for you that. Imagine her saying, "Feel the burn." <laughs> oh God, feel the that thorns on this rose. God. Okay, um, <laughs> my poor Solvari element or Mesmer, she's uh, terrible. So yeah, that's elementalist. Uh, Drek, you have an el- you have a level eighty elementalist, don't you? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I need to get it to eighty. But at, what do you what do you think about like all this tempest stuff? Fifty five, maybe I want to say. Oh, that's, that's still pretty good. Yeah, um, I'm kind of looking forward to the fire tornado. That sounds kind of oh, cool. Oh yeah, I like that. Fire tornado sounds pretty cool. My my Ellie does all fire. Some and... of the images they have of the fire skills look pretty cool. Yeah, they do. So there's I also was... the warhorn one where it looks like they're like breathing fire through the warhorn. I... I have to admit, though, I was really looking forward to the sword thing. So yeah. I was pretty disappointed when that turned out not to be. But um, uh, we'll see. If only we could really wield a sword and a staff, then we'd really have to get off spec. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then we would really yeah. have to get off spec. I don't think that's going to happen, though, unfortunately. Oh, well. Mm. But this week we also got some information on the Sh- some more information on the Shiro and Revenant um, profession. Uh, last week, as I said, they revealed the Shiro Tagachi specialization, and then there's going to be a live stream. And in this live stream, and also uh, as a post on the forums, Roy Kroniker uh, detailed a lot of the changes that he's doing to the Revenant. He has taken a ton of the feedback from the beta weekend. Um, like we said last week, the Revenant was not in a good place for that beta weekend, but Roy Kroniker has taken a lot of that to heart, and he posted it. He had to make two forum posts because it was so long, all the information that he was doing. Um, but the kind of general thing, uh, he 
Revenants will now have weapon swap, which is good. I don't think I articulated it last week because I was having a problem breathing and articulating. Living. Yeah, I was just having a problem living last week, so I didn't get to say everything I wanted to about the Revenant. But one of my problems was that each weapon is so uh, designed to be used with a specific legend that it's not that it, it wasn't working that great because you could only have one weapon at a time, but you could still switch legends in combat, so it's kind of awkward. But now they are adding weapon swaps, so you can swap weapons, and I assume you can also swap the legends as well. So that, I think, is a much-needed change. Um, they're also making Invoking Legends instant cast rather than having to wait through the animation because some of those were long. Um, they're also greatly buffing the damage on all of the weapons, some of them by like 100-plus percent. Oh. Very nice. Well, well that sounds a little OP. Uh, to be fair, I'm... some well, I think the 100-plus percent was on the staff, which was terrible DPS. Okay, well, I was, yeah, I'm just gonna be skeptical of kind of changes like that out of past experience of when people go overboard trying to buff something that's weak and ends up going right in the other direction. So, well, here's an example. So, uh, the first couple of skills for staff, rapid swipe, increased damage by 30%, forceful bash by 36%, um, punishing sweep by 33%, debilitating slam by 100%, renewing wave, increase the healing power by 30%, and surge of the mist increased damage by 11%. So that's not bad. It was only one skill by 100%. Um, most of the 100% things are healing, power kind of stuff. Uh, let's see. Hammer increased damage by 12%, by 25%, by 17%, by 12.5%. So that's mostly, you know, not too bad. Yeah. It's it's reasonable given how not great yeah, the DPS like, I, was. We were saying last last week that it is like, it was really bad just in mm -hmm. general. So across the board changes probably are like this kind of needed. I'm still slightly worried that they will go overboard because developers tend to do that because they can't, they're not like gods. They can't predict exactly right. how powerful all these changes combined are going to make a class. So well, we'll we probably still have, have to keep retuning. Right. Well, yeah, there's going to be more beta weekends. Uh, hopefully in the next one, we will have access to the Shiro specialization now that it's been revealed that will be nice to test and so yeah i'm looking forward to seeing these revenant changes in the next beta event mm -hmm. and we also would like to say congrats to nicolo for winning our standard edition of heart of thorns giveaway uh we finished off that giveaway this week so congrats um i don't know what the next tier of patreon is for the players alliance but um it's yeah. a ddo vip code there you go so if you play DDO, you can donate to the Players Alliance Network's Patreon and help our sites, you know, keep doing stuff and, you know, doing giveaways for various things. But that's about it for game news. We there Besides the uh, Temple Tempest uh, thing, not a whole lot going on this week. So we're going to go on to news from our site. And Drac, what, is, what are the sounds of Tyria this week? I am still taking a look at the Guild Wars Prophecy soundtrack, which, of course, that is the first game. This week, we're taking a look at the Temple of Tolerance. This uh, is a song that played a lot in the original Guild Wars. Um, it, uh, the Temple of Tolerance was a temple that was built by the White Mantle, and it lies just west of the Dela Iso seaboard. And you spend a lot of time out in the area around there. So this song played a lot in game. And I can just always remember hearing the song and then seeing a bunch of white mantle come charging over the hills at you. So kind of brings back memories from playing the first game. I think this is one they like to use in human areas, I believe, because I've heard this one a lot. That would make sense. And, Very familiar with this trap. Yeah, and then again, this is another one of those. Um, the original Guild Wars soundtrack seems to have a lot of those tracks that I just call it's a Guild Wars song because it just mm -hmm. sounds like Guild Wars when you hear it. And this is definitely one of those that just has that Guild Wars vibe to it. So Cool. All right, and this week's video spotlight is called Courting Lunacy, and it is an interesting little video. Um, Thoros, why don't you tell us about that? Uh, it's a kind of a voiceless um, movie sort of thing. It's yeah, it's kind of hard to describe because I haven't really seen videos like this. 
on any MMO, really. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you kind of have to watch it to really understand it. It's, it's um, interesting, to say the least. Yeah, it's like a little kind of short story. It's yeah. like a silent movie. Short yeah, it's, actually, that's probably story. the best way of putting it. It's a silent movie without captions telling you what they're saying. You can kind of figure right. it out by emotes and such, though. Mm-hmm. I kind of had to watch the final bit about four times to figure out what the heck had happened. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, be warned, you might have to do that. Yeah, and it's pretty interesting. It takes place during Halloween at Lion's Art, so everything's all creepy and pumpkin-y and scary-looking. Which I hadn't seen before, because I wasn't um, oh, yeah. really playing that much when the Halloween was around last time. So mm. Yeah, and I think this is from uh, original Lion's Arch as well, so it's definitely a very different-looking Lion's Arch than what we mm. currently have, obviously. But yeah, it's it's a good video, I think, so everybody should go check that out. And this week's community outfit is actually two outfits. Somebody sent in um, pictures of two of their characters, Effie and Fitz, together. Um, so for Effie, Effie is a Sura ranger, and she's got those cute little buns in her hair, and it's all very um, green and like kind of an orangey-brown caramel color. And they also sent in a picture of their human thief, Fitz, who is using some nice kind of uh, the assassin's coat and the subterfuge hood. I always like the subterfuge hood. It looks very nice. Um, And the assassin's coat has, like, daggers on it, which looks pretty cool and, you know, Hmm. fitting for a thief. Those gloves look nice, too. Having that little dagger thing pointing back on the um, completely impractical. uh, The gloves, Oh, yeah. Completely impractical. They are very impractical. but, but they yeah, look, they look cool. pretty nice. I actually <laughs> need to consider having maybe those for my human when I end up rolling one. Yeah. It's it's nice because you don't see a lot of... Well, you see a lot of human thieves. But usually they're female. And when they are male, they're usually... I don't know. I feel like I don't really see those pieces very often besides the subterfuge hood. Yeah, they usually just like full black leather. Mm. like. Complete yeah, this one is very kind of grayish and navy blue, which is definitely not what you usually see in a thief, so it's good to see something else. Mm, nice to have some variety. Mm-hmm. And this week, we do have a lore book entry, and the lore book is where we take a look at a place, character, race, or artifact, and examine the lore surrounding it and why it's important to our gameplay. And today I decided to talk about magic. Just generally, it's not really a thing, but it's something that obviously affects our gameplay, because a lot of our professions utilize magic. And something that I often wonder is, like, how... Like, what, what is this magic that we use? Like, how do you tell what kind of a magic user you are? All that stuff. Um, basically, magic was originally given to the sentient races of Tyria by a, the human god, Abaddon, who then became not a god. Um, and King Doric of the human kingdoms begged the gods to take the magic back because it had caused so much bloodshed and wars. And it's just they were like, this is just not good. Can you, like take this back, please. We really aren't interested in this. Um, So the human gods created the bloodstone to limit the use of magic in the world. Um, And they split it into five different pieces. Um, Four of the pieces were for each of the different schools of magic, which I'll get to in a second. And they plunged all these bloodstone pieces into a volcano in the Ring of Fire, which if you look at your map and game is kind of in the southern part of the... It's kind of to the east of Or, or west of Or, because I know how directions work. Um, And basically, this bloodstone made it so that even today, Tyrians cannot use magic to its original fullest extent that it was when the gods originally bestowed it on Tyria, um, unless they... Unless Tyrians work together with their magic. Um, And like I said, there are four schools of magic. There's preservation, destruction, aggression, and denial. And on my research, I couldn't, like, I didn't find anything saying which kinds of professions use which magic. But I think it's something interesting to think about and maybe even think about how different kind, like, different elementalists might use different kinds of magic. Or, you know, obviously a elementalist who's water attuned might prefer to use preservation or something when they're, you know, using water. Whereas a elementalist using destruction magic is, you know, fire, I guess. Mm, or Earth, I suppose, then. Or Earth, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I feel like aggression magic is probably necromancers. That makes sense. Mm. Um, yeah. See, I kind of thought more denial. I denial can see both like ones. like mesmers, I suppose. It's kind of like, it doesn't really 
um, it's not 100% like one to one. This is what it represents. It's kind right. of right. Yeah. Yeah. Awkward, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and I kind of wish that in Guild Wars two they would talk more about like what what your profession means and like how you like how you determine what profession you are. Because from what I understand, in Guild Wars one, there were whole like quest sections where you would learn about like what di- what different professions mean in human society and stuff. Mm. Because this is the first I heard of these schools, mind you. They don't seem to really talk about them much nowadays. Yeah, like I found this on the this information on the the Guild Wars one wiki. So it's so, definitely so I guess this older is lore. That's kind of not. I, won't, I guess I want to say died out at this point, but mm-hmm. at least become much less um, relevant. Right. In the original Guild Wars, there is a bunch of the main missions revolve around the Bloodstone. Yeah, there's that too. So, yeah, this is very much uh, ingrained in the original Guild Wars game. Mm -hmm. And you kind of see the effects of what magic does uh, to the world, I think, more in the original Guild Wars than than you do in 2. Yeah, this, I feel like, yeah, Guild Wars 1 is more about how people use magic, whereas Guild Wars 2 is more about just trying to protect, not, not protect the world from magic, but from the dragons who feed on the magic, so... Yeah, yeah it's... and like leftover magic and like just stuff that's been there for a while it kind of comes in a lot too. Mm-hmm. Like his yeah. random artifact that's been there for a hundred thousand years, and this is yeah, yeah. But how to use magic? Does. Right? Yeah, how to use magic and what the magic does isn't really as talked about in this game as much, which is mm-hmm. kind of disappointing. But uh, bloodstones oh, well. though got plenty of dust. Oh yeah, there's heaps of bloodstone dust everywhere. I have no use for any of it. Why should make Marjorie? Well, that's a speaking of crafting, Thoros. What did you do this week? It's like it was destiny, <laughs> just for, <laughs> just for that to come in. <sighs> I uh, tried crafting this week because I kind of been mulling over a little bit of trying to go for Mordry. Otherwise, I'm not really interested in crafting at all. I just mm-hmm. kind of wanted that to get rid of my bloodstone dust. Um, and, yeah, I picked, I think I was on my Necro, and I just picked Taylor just to start off. Because I know you have to get, like, all of them right to 400, or whatever the maximum is. You don't have to get. I mean, if you know people who can craft stuff for you, you don't need all of them. You need There's at a least... a fair few, I presume. Um, I think the only one I got to 400 was Weaponsmith, and that was just because I had... You need to make the Bloodstone bricks. Right. Um, everything else, I had people give me stuff. <laughs> Yeah, well, I obviously didn't do that much preparation in going into this, but yeah, I just figured well, I'd pick that one because it seems, you know, light armor kind of relevant to Necros anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I looked up a guide, I believe it was on Guild Wars 2 Crafting, something like that, .com. Around yeah, like GW2 like Crafting, something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I had a pretty nice guide on there. I kind of followed that as much as possible and... Maybe it's because I was trying to tunnel on a guide and just power farm it, but it it was boring. Like in general, they just didn't like they had the whole discovery part where you just trying to make anything, but it, that seemed too formulaic because mm-hmm. you could tell this um, rune or whatever, mm-hmm. like this aspect or something, whatever they called it, would make it into a weapon that had this stats on it, and it just you could right. tell what it was going to make. It, there was no mystery right. there. You might, well, no, because you hate crafting, but I was going to say you might be interested in Chef because it's, Chef is the least formulaic one, I find, because with the Discovery tab, it is more like, oh, if I throw tomatoes and flour and chicken together, what will happen, if anything? And, yeah, you know. Seems, I know, from what I've seen, like, uh, you stuffing our guild vault with foods, um, <laughs> there seems to be a lot more variety of stuff. Although, I guess, on the other hand, the variety isn't really relevant most of the time. It's just more fluff. Yeah, it Which, is. Which, you know, has its place, but, you know. Yeah. And, I mean, some of the higher level, higher tier foods are really good. Like, they give, like, plus 10, plus 20% magic find, or, like, plus 60 vitality, which is, you know, oh, pretty I'm good. Sure. Yeah. I just never really bothered with consumables on any of them, or I've played that much. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I just, it seemed too, yeah, formulaic, I guess, is the word that, it's most it's just yeah i know exactly how this is going on it's just it didn't seem that fun especially the thing where you can't really 
like the eventually this recipe just doesn't give you XP anymore. Right. Yeah, that is frustrating. And it's like, yeah, I just I didn't really like it at all. So mm. I'm not getting Modri apparently. I wonder if I should just trash my Bloodstone disc because I'm not really using it. Yeah. Or all of the random account bound stuff that I'll never use. Might keep yeah. the gifts of exploration just to just to taunt people with them. Yes, people who need them. Mm. Certainly, we don't know anybody like that. Nope. No one making a legendary weapon. No, certainly. Certainly nobody is making a legendary, especially not on this podcast. Yeah. So, speaking of world completion, um, I just finished it again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> for, the, God. for the second time on my Necromancer, my Asura Necro. You were just insane. Has... You were just yeah. insane. That is all there is to it. Well, in fairness, I was at like 98% for at least two weeks from when we were doing them. I kind yeah. of got impatient, so I just finished Cursed Jaw by myself. No, not my, the favorite zone ever. That, that was very more... passive aggressive of you. Yeah. A little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> I, I guess I'm impatient when it comes to world completion. I just have to get it done, mm-hmm. which is probably how I managed to do it twice. Well, yeah. Yeah. It, it was, you know, I don't know why I'm just, I do them, but because considering like the end point reward is a gift of exploration or two of them. Which I can't use because I don't craft. And that's what you get, really. You don't really get yeah. anything else for getting all of it. You had a pretty star next to your name. Yeah, I guess. And the original achievement, so you can use mm. that new, I guess. But yeah. I don't know. I guess the game just makes it very easy to kind of focus on completion. I guess right. I'll put it that way. A lot of them are kind of are really vague with how much you've done of an area or a character or anything like that. Yeah. Gildas was really, really upfront and efficient of how they show it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, like, I... Back when I did YouTube and played Lord of the Rings Online, I tried to do a completionist playthrough of Lord of the Rings Online, and, well, the, I didn't get very far, first of all. But um, I think a lot of the popularity of that series I was doing was because in that game, like many other MMOs, it's a lot more unclear what all you've done. You have to kind of research a lot to see any hidden deeds that you've yes. not yet done, kind of stuff like that. And whereas Guild Wars 2 does a very thorough job of helping you track what you've done, you get percentages and uh, like very clear achievements that tell you, oh, you are this out of this. And yeah, it's very helpful. Yeah, I guess it's kind of weird in that while I was complaining about crafting being formulaic, the will completion itself is pretty formulaic in terms of it's yeah, very you formulaic. do, hearts... Vistas, points of interest, and skill points, or hero points as they call them now. It or hero challenges or whatever. And yeah, for some reason that yeah, that doesn't bother me. I don't know why. It's just I guess crafting is you're kind of just standing in the same spot, just mm. looking at spreadsheets. It's just Yeah, true. It's why I can't play Eve. And it's just yeah, I don't know. I guess I'm doing well completion again on my third character though, my current char, who is oh uh, I think God. level twenty three. He is about a quarter of the way done. You're ridiculous. Sure, probably. <laughs> uh, and I think the only other thing I did was try to do some PvP this week. Um, mm. It didn't work so well because of some connection issues that I've been having to the game as of pretty yeah. recently. Well, it's weird because Sarah and I were playing just before you logged in, and I also was having some very out-of-nowhere severe connection issues and then they lasted for about five, ten minutes, and then all they just disappeared again. And then we were playing with you, and you had the same issue. Literally, as we started up that first round, as we were going into the actual place, I my connection dropped, and I had to go back in. I went straight back to the character so like screen. I had to log back in. It was stupid, and I could not play the whole time we were playing. We did about what, maybe two or three two, rounds. Yeah, two something rounds like that. was it? Yeah, mm-hmm. I it, my ping was at upwards of like. A thousand, and it was usually around six hundred. So I was doing yeah. like it was a slideshow for me. Yeah, I think there was something weird going on because I also saw people in map chat earlier complaining about the same thing that day. So I think there was something weird going on with the game. A lot of people were having connection issues. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I guess I I didn't do good by any stretch of the imagination, but I somehow managed to win a couple of one v ones despite that. I'm assuming that the person I was fighting also had connection issues, because if they did, not <laughs> Yeah. I know I yeah. did manage to um, defeat a Guardian on my Necro while, yeah, with that kind of 600 ping. 
Which, yeah, I'm going to make the assumption that they were also lagging. But, you know, either way, mm-hmm. it's nice to actually win without, uh, despite not knowing what the heck is going on. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Mm-hmm. So uh, what did you do this week? Drek. Me, not a thing. I did not even log in to either game this week. I just had Jeez. a really busy week, yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, I had, it's that uh, time of year. Yeah, and then plus uh, Gen Con's coming up next week, so I'm trying Ooh. to get stuff done for work that I can do for some of my customers that I can do ahead of time. So when I'm gone next week, uh, I'm not going to get panicked phone calls, so, you know. So Felicia Day is not going to be at Gen Con this year, correct? She is not. How sad are you on I, a scale of 1 to 10? Um, about 100. Oh Does your gosh. effort feel wasted now? Yes. See, because I, I was going to, since I'm going there as press for DDO players, I was going to, like, figure I could wrangle an interview with her and, you know, we could have an interview. She plays D&D, so there you go. Yeah, see, and then I would bring up the whole, you know, Guild Wars thing and we could loop it back to this show and we could play it on the show and it would be great. And the Felicia Day circle would be closed. But alas, she's not going to be there, so. Oh, no. Yeah, I'm bummed out. Understandably so. You can always listen to her voice in game. Yeah. From an annoying character. TV apparently, but that's and, and on oh well, yes. <laughs> Thanks to Drac, I can now story. recognize Felicia Day's voice from across the house while somebody else is watching TV. Achievement mm. unlocked. Hundred uh, percent completion. <laughs> so, besides uh, hearing Felicia Day's voice on your TV, what did you do this week, Seth? I did so much Vine Wrath and Silver Waste Chest Farming, like. So much. I was doing a bit of research. Um, I wasn't pleased with how much... I felt like I wasn't made... Like, I was doing Vine Wrath runs and chest trains and stuff, and I felt like I wasn't really getting as much gold as I thought I should be. And so I was doing some research and kind of tweaking my methods, and so now I have a method of... Um, it's not so much, like, how you do Vine Wrath in the chest runs, so much as, like, what you do with the loot you get from them. Um, and so I have a new method of dealing with all the loot, and I get a lot of gold now. In four days, I made 100 gold. And wow. that was really exciting. And then today, this morning, just before the show, uh, my Chaos Greatsword skin finally sold on the trading post. And I made 200 gold. So I finally hit 200 gold. And I got, got the, the golden too, title. Yeah, I got the achievement. I got the golden title. Um, the first 100 gold I made, I spent on a skin. <laughs> I, <laughs> I bought the Lovestruck Protector skin. Which is like a big pink glittery shield. That For a character my... you don't play. I've been playing my Mesmer this week. I've been using her to do Vine Wrath. Uh, well, I got you don't my use Mesmer. The <laughs> well, not yet, but once she, once yeah. you know, Heart of Thorns come out and she's a Chronomancer, she is going to have a pink glittery shield, and it's going to be great. Um, then the when I got two hundred gold, I was a bit more responsible, and I spent all that towards Twilight. So I have the gift of Twilight now that is fully complete. Um, all I have left for Twilight is the gift of exploration, which will just require me stopping being lazy and actually go finish Timberline Falls and Cursed Shore. Um, the tier six crafting materials, um, I have about at least a hundred of each. And Dusk, which is, you know, it's only 1,289 gold, Dusk. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, yeah, just 1,289 gold. I mean, you made 100 gold in four days, right? Yeah. So just multiply that by 12. Mm-hmm. It's just, so just, in just a couple like months. almost two months. It's just yeah, just fine. two months of grinding for hours a day. And just mm-hmm. as you get it, they're going to you know, release Heart of Thorns. That's, and then... Yeah, the day I make that much money, Heart of Thorns will release. The, the <laughs> price will plummet um, because people will be able to craft it. Um, yeah, no big deal. So, you should do that yeah. now then so the expansion comes out sooner. That's a good point, because that's how that works. That's, of course. Of course how that's, that's going to work. Way the, it's the way the world works. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's what I did this week. I just made a lot of gold. Um, I'll probably do a guide. Either, I'm not sure if I'm going to do a video or a write-up of it. Um, it's, you know, helping people get gold, because it's definitely a struggle. Yes. People. Yes. Mm. Not mm. you. It's Not everything's about you, Athoros. <laughs> you said that about the last <laughs> making money guide that you did, and it felt very addressed to me because I was very poor at the time. Well, 
but now you're not, so... Yeah, I haven't made too much money recently. Maybe just probably because I haven't played that much, but also because low-level characters, they just generally don't make much money. I think I'm just now at the point where it's actually worth um, gathering materials. Because, like, tier Mm -hmm. one, you don't get anything, really, at all. It's almost just not worth it. But, yeah. Yeah. I have to see into maybe trying that a bit Mm -hmm. more. Well, I'm writing the guide for everyone, not just you. So... We didn't get any donations this week, but we would love your support. You can help support Guild Wars players by supporting our podcasting network, the Players Alliance. You can go to our donation page, and you'll find a link there to the Patreon. And you can get rewards like being mentioned on the show, or you can even be a guest on the show. Um, And if you'd like to contact us, you can do so by emailing us at podcast at guildwarsplayers.com. You can send us questions or topics or advice or whatever. You can also send us asks to guildwarsplayers.tumblr.com. And you can also contact us on Twitter. The Players Alliance Network is at Players Ally, and our site is at GW Players. I'm at Sithrith, Jack's at at Draculetta underscore 72, and Ethelros is at Ethelros. And of course, we're in game Sithrith.6741, Draculetta.7410, and Ethelros.3164. The Players Alliance has a whole bunch of live shows besides ours at 8.30 p.m. on Monday at Eastern Time is DDO Players News. Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. Eastern is our show, and Saturdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern is Lotro Players News. You can get to the uh, chat room for all these by going to guildwarsplayers.com slash live. And this is Sithrith. Thank you for listening and reminding you to look before you leap.